The Buddha once said that one of the signs of being a wise person is knowing what are your problems and what are not your problems. And working only on what really are your problems. Not carrying around everything else. This is an important point to reflect on. It was one of the first things I learned from a John Fuang. In Thai they say, in other words, what is your issues? What are your issues? What are your problems? What are not your problems? This is basic discernment. And it's important to keep this point in mind as you go through the Buddha's various teachings. To see exactly what problems he's attacking, the genuine problems you have, which of course are the problems of suffering the stress and suffering you create for yourself. And that was the topic of his first sermon when a group of monks went to pay their respects to Sariputta before going off to a land where Buddhist monks hadn't been before. Sariputta said, when people meet you, they're going to ask you, what are your teachers' teachings? What's the first thing you're going to tell them? And so the monks said, well, we'd like to hear your advice on what should be the first thing we tell them. And Sariputta says, our teacher teaches the letting go of attachment to the five khandhas, to your body, feelings, perceptions, thought constructs, consciousness. He said, then they'll ask you, what are the drawbacks of clinging to these things? And it's because we cling, we suffer. That's what it boils down to. And what are the advantages of not cling? Well, the advantages of not cling are that when you don't cling, you don't suffer. That, in a nutshell, are the Buddhist teachings. That clinging is suffering, and it's something you <coughs> can do or you cannot do. It's not that we have to cling. So that's the problem. We're clinging. And we don't know how to let go. So the purpose of the practice is learning how to let go of our clinging to those five types of things. Keep this in mind as you look at the Buddha's other teachings, because that, this basic point forms the framework for what we're doing, learning how to let go of our ways of clinging. We cling through sensual passion, we cling through our views, we cling through our fixed ideas that, of how to do certain things, that if you only do this right or do that right, that'll take care of everything. In other words, if you don't step on the cracks in the sidewalk, that kind of ritualistic thinking that we all bring from us, with us from childhood, it's still there. Even though our society has learned to dump on as many rituals as possible, still we have lots of ideas about there's a proper way of doing this and there's a way of doing that, and that absolves you from all responsibility, because you did it the right way. Without looking into your intention behind it. That's a kind of clinging, too. And finally, there's clinging to doctrines of the self. This is probably the deepest, <coughs> the most firmly entrenched form of clinging. Which is why the Buddha focused so much attention on learning, giving us the tools to uproot this clinging. But you have to look exactly what the problem is. Sometimes a bit people say that the Buddha's teachings are not self, or that there is no self. Well, is that your problem? Do you have a problem because you have a self, or do you have a problem because you create a self and cling to it? That's the issue. If you keep creating a sense of self, that's something you can learn how to take apart. But do you suffer because you have a self? We suffer because we think we have a self, and we get all wound up in maintaining that sense of self. But when you look at what's actually going on in the mind, we keep creating a sense of self. That's the problem. That's the 
what the not-self teachings are all designed to take apart. Because if you looked at it the other way, say, well, what would life be like if you didn't have a self? Well, that would create problems, too. There are not as many of these outlined in the canon, but they're there. When the Buddha said, if you taught people that they had no self, they'd bewilder. What happened to the self I used to have? Or there'd be people who would try to use the, the teaching that there is no self to get around karmic responsibility. If there is no self, then what self is going to suffer from the karmic deeds done by what is not self? There was one a monk came up with that question one time. And you see this all around you. People say, well, if there's no self, I can just go ahead and do as I like, because you know, what karmic consequences can there be? I'm not going to be around for them. That's a problem, too. But very few people can maintain that idea that there is no self, even if they have it as a doctrine. When you look at the way they behave, they don't behave in that way at all. If they really felt they had no self, they wouldn't take care of anything, they wouldn't worry, they wouldn't make any effort at all, because they wouldn't be there to enjoy the fruits of their effort. But people keep acting in this way, which means that even if they have a formal doctrine that there is no self, that still deep down inside they act as if there is one. So the real problem is our attachment to the notion of self that we keep creating. Because what do we do? We we latch on to the five khandhas. And what are the five khandhas? Well, those are construct, constructed things as well. If you look at what the Buddha has to say about them, there's always an element of fabrication, even in your experience of form, your experience of feeling, perception, fabrication, consciousness. There's the potential for these five kinds of things to be experienced, but you have to take that potential and work with it in order to turn it into an actual experience in the present moment. So there's already something fabricated there. You're taking fabricated things. And then you're going to take those and you're going to turn them into a self. Because when you analyze exactly where your sense of self lies, it's in one of these five kinds of things. You either identify with a body, the sense that you are the body, or something yourself is in the body or the body is in the self, or the self possesses the body, or feelings, the same four types of relationship. Either you identify directly with the feeling itself, or you have a sense that yourself owns the feeling, or your feeling is yourself, the feeling is in yourself, or yourself is in the feeling, and so on down with the different aggregates. And so what the Buddha has us do is focus on this sense of self that we create. And to say precisely that it is a creation, and that in the course of creating it, you cling to it, and because you cling to it, there is suffering. That's what your real problem is. And so you learn to take that apart. So as we sit here and meditate, what do we do? Well, we take those same five khandhas and we turn them into a path. You work with the body, work with the feeling, adjust the feelings in the body through the breath. So there we have two of the khandhas already, body or form and feeling. And then you have your perceptions of the breath. The breath is coming in here, the breath is going out there. This is what you do in order to have to breathe. That's a perception. The way you label the different sensations in the body, as we meditate, we learn to label more and more of our sense of the body as a type of breathing, type of breath energy, as a way of getting the, your awareness to become totally immersed in the body as a whole. And as for the fabrication, well, that's the directed thought and the evaluation that you do as you're working with the breath. You should keep reminding yourself to stay with the breath. The breath itself is a kind of fabrication. The directed thought and evaluation, that's a kind of fabrication. And the feelings and perceptions around the breath, that's fabrication too. Physical, verbal, mental fabrication. It's all right here. And then there's the consciousness underlying all these things. 
So what we do as we practice is we take these five kindness that we've been building into a self and then we turn them into something else, turn them into a path. Because as you turn them into this kind of path, it's easier and easier to watch them, to get a sense of what you're doing. Because there's a greater sense of well-being, there's a greater sense of calm, peace, stillness in the mind. So those bricks you've been carrying on your shoulders, you take them down and you pave a path with them. And then as the path gets smoother and smoother, you can start inspecting the path and realize, well, hey, these are the same old five khandhas. And you realize that even the path is something impermanent. You can't identify with that. Basically, when you take the khandhas and turn them into the path, this is as good as the khandhas can get. And if you're really observing, you notice that it's not all that good. And the Buddha said, when you see that, even in the state of jhana, he says, if you can get really still, really plugged into that state of absorption, after all, you can pull yourself out a little bit and look at that state of absorption and see that there the khand is still there, and they're still. Wherever there's fabrication, there's going to be stress. It's going to be impermanent, stressful. And do you really want to identify with something that's impermanent and stressful? And when it really hits home, then you incline the mind, as the Buddha says, to the deathless. And it's through inclining it to the deathless that you can let go of these things. The path this way turns into a runway and you take off. You learn how to stop creating suffering, which was the original problem. And at that point, would you say there is a self or there is no self? It's irrelevant to the issue. You know that if you create your sense of self, you're going to suffer. You create that sense of self-identity, so you've learned to stop doing that. But whether in the larger scheme of things there's actually a self lurking back there, there is no self lurking back there, that's irrelevant to the problem. That actually gets in the way. If you really think there is a self, you tie yourself up in knots. If you think there is no self, well, that creates problems as well. The issue at this point is, is a non-issue. So it's important you realize that the teachings are there to point to your real problems. And the real problem is the way you create suffering for yourself. Now you find along the path that there are times when a sense of self-reliance, self-responsibility, sense of self-worth and self-esteem, these are useful things on the path. They keep you there. And so you notice on certain levels of the teaching, the Buddha actually encourages when he tells you to rely on yourself. In other words, as a way of teaching you to not go around hoping for other people or outside forces or fate or whatever to do everything for you. You realize you've got to do this practice. You've got to take care of your problems. And you need a sense of self-worth in order to st stick with the path. You need a sense of self-reliance so that in these stages of the path, you know, the sense of self is a useful thing to have. It's only when you've taken that sense of self as far as it can go that you want to start taking it apart. Start realizing that that sense of self is, is an activity, it's something you do. The, the Buddhist term is this activity of I-making and my-making. That's the problem. The problem is the issue of whether there's a self back there. That's not a problem. If there is a self, it's not a problem. If there's no self, that's not a problem. But if you believe there is or is not a self, that creates a problem. It's the belief that's the issue. It's the self-making. When you 
weigh it down and cling to it. That's what's the issue. That's what the problem is. So as a wise person, you want to focus on what the real problem is. And as for anything that's not a real problem, you let it go. Like the story of the stupid people they were telling today. The man's going to marry off his wife, goes to the house of the groom and sees this stairwell where there's an old axe hanging over the door, held up by rusty nails. And he stops to think, well, someday those nails are going to rust out and it's going to happen and it's going to fall and it's going to kill my grandchild. And he starts crying. The sign of a stupid person worrying about things that are not really the issue. So as meditators, you want to focus on what your real issues are. And the issues are, how are you creating suffering and how can you learn to stop creating that suffering? And so you look at your sense of self. In what ways is your sense of self a useful thing to help you stop? When it teaches you self-reliance, when it teaches you self-responsibility, when you learn how to act on those principles so you can build a sense of self-esteem, then it's a useful principle, a useful activity. Once you've learned how to create that good, strong sense of a competent self, then you can take it apart. Many times if you try to take it apart before you have that sense of competence, it's kind of a neurotic running away. You don't like yourself, and teaching of not-self sounds like a good way of obliterating that self you don't like. That doesn't work. First you have to create a sense of self-reliance, self-esteem. In other words, take that sense of self as far as it can, you can take it. And then when you take it as far as it can help, help you go, then you drop it. Take it apart. Take that activity apart. As part of your larger project of learning how to stop creating suffering for yourself. So always keep this point in mind, that we're working on our real problems here. And as the Buddha pointed out, that this is what our real problem is, the suffering we're creating for ourselves. And he offers a solution to the problem. You focus on that solution. As for other issues, just put them aside. Don't weigh yourself down. Don't burden yourself with things that are not real issues. In this way, your practice stays on course. Your thinking about the practice keeps coming back and helping your meditation rather than leading you off into other lands. And other chat rooms. The Buddha's teachings were designed to be tools that you apply right here to what you're doing right here, right now. So make sure you use them properly. They're sharp tools. They're precise. And because they're sharp and precise, they can cut you if you're not careful. But if you keep their true purpose in mind, they, they do it a lot of good.